Welcome to Invasive Species 101 for the 2020 Boat Launch Steward Field Season. You're going to jump right in and get started with the definition of invasive species. Invasive species are plants, animals, and pathogens that are non-native to the region and they have to cause some type of harm that is measurable. That can be harm to the economy, to the environment, or to human health. In this slide, we have a photo in the lower left of a dense bed of Eurasian water milfoil growing below the water surface, crowding out any other native species. In the middle photo, we have spiny water flea grouped in hundreds. This is an invasive crustacean, and they're on a downrigger of an angler's line. And on the lower right, we have the invasive zebra mussel growing on top of each other, an invasive mollusk. Um, present in our region. What's the difference between invasive species and native or non-native or nuisance species? Native species are defined as species that are indigenous to this region, pre-European settlement, so we've known them to be here for a long time. Non-native species are often introduced either on purpose or by accident and it's brought in from an area outside of the historic range of the species. On the left, we have a photograph of a beautiful uh, poppy plant, um, a poppy tulip, and on the right of some apples. Those are examples of non-native species that do not grow um, in a way that causes harm to the environment um, or the economy or human health. Invasive species are those that are non-native, that's the first qualifier, um, and because they can rapidly reproduce or outcompete or displace other native species or cause um, negative impact to the economy or human health, those are the species which we call invasive. So they're non-native and they cause some kind of measurable harm. Nuisance is a word that we use to describe organisms that we don't like because they interfere with the activities that we like to take part in. So native species can grow in nuisance levels. Native species um, we, we can see growing in such dense populations that uh, the public actually thinks that they're invasive. Um, Non-native species can be nuisances, and once they are measured to cause that harm, we move them into the invasive species category. So how do non-native species become invasive? Most of these non-natives are introduced into ecosystems where they lack their native predators, diseases, or parasites. So they have a competitive advantage in a new environment. If they are plants, they often can produce um, seeds earlier in the season, um, and they do not require uh, certain water temperatures for reproduction. They might be able to reproduce vegetatively as well as by seed, and they have the, that, that greater ability to occupy different types of habitats. For animals, they might be able to reproduce sexually and asexually. They might have greater tolerances for dissolved oxygen levels or salinity. They are generally able to colonize many different sites. So they are able to monopolize on the resources that are available and again, outcompete those native species. Some non-natives are moved into the invasive category because they produce toxins that can impact native species or even affect humans. Stepping back and thinking about where we are located geographically in the region is important to understand the pressures of non-native invasive species that are exerted on the Adirondack region. You can see here the state, the New England states, New York, and the province of Quebec and New Brunswick, and a piece of Ontario. Uh, we are also surrounded in the Adirondack region by the St. Lawrence Seaway that's coming in uh, above the Adirondack Park there, the Great Lakes, 
and the Hudson River. And I have this map here to explain that invasive species do not respect political boundaries. Uh, they don't respect um, oftentimes uh, the, the other types of boundaries like the blue line that outlines the Adirondack Park. They're more likely to follow watershed boundaries or temperature ranges in terms of where they might be able to move and spread. Invasive species have many different vectors of movement or pathways by which they can move and become introduced. The greatest source of non-native invasive species to the Great Lakes region is ballast water. Ballast water is very important for maintaining a large cargo ship's stability in the in the ocean while it's transiting. So it's a it's a weight and safety factor. But to explain, um, a vessel will take on ballast water in its port where it's loaded up and then transit the ocean and sometimes offload or exchange ballast in its destination port. And that is how a number of non-native and invasive species have entered the Great Lakes and then spread. Um, the other common pathways um, that are often uh, unintentional pathways or vectors of movement are um, when we have escapes from nurseries, water gardens, when we have tropical storms or hurricanes, you can imagine that um, the flooding can move these species across the landscapes into river rivers and then down into receiving waters. For the Adirondack Park, it's important to think about the roadways and the overland transport on recreational uh, boats and trailers because that's how many invasive species are moving into and penetrating into the center of the Adirondack Park. Another really important vector for the Northeast are canals. I'll, expl I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then there are lesser um, vectors of, of movement and transport like equipment such as clothing or gear, even tr being transported on your dog's fur in, in mulch material. And often for those forest pests and pathogens, they're unintentionally introduced by the movement of firewood uh, as camping and recreational use in the Adirondack Park is uh, very popular. There are a few natural pathways by which these species can move, becoming attached to wildlife or ingested by wildlife and then uh, excreted into the landscape or the natural movement of wind and waterways. This map is to highlight, uh, again, those pressures of non-native and invasive species on the Adirondack Park region. We have 187 known non-native and invasive species. So not all of those 187 are invasive. They are all non-native, but a, a subset of those have been measured to cause harm. That's what the 187 number represents. Similarly, we have uh, 87 known non-native invasives in the St. Lawrence, 51 in Lake Champlain, and 122 in the Hudson River. And this is important because these waterways are connected by man-made canals. The Erie Canal uh, connects the Great Lakes to the Hudson River. The Champlain Canal connects the Hudson River to Lake Champlain and the Chambly Canal connects the northern part of Lake Champlain to the Richelieu River and back to the St. Lawrence Seaway. So there is opportunity for plants to become entrained on watercraft and move through the systems, for zooplankton to float through the systems and for fish to freely swim through these systems, which opens up the movement and the threat of spread. Your job as a boat launch steward is really exciting because you're the boots on the ground. You're out there interacting with the public and sharing best management practices to help prevent the spread and introduction of invasive species. So we don't end up in situations like the one photographed here. This is the southern end of Lake Champlain and this is a floating aquatic invasive plant called water chestnut. Many refer to it as a putting green 
uh, when it grows in very dense beds in the southern end of the lake. Underneath this dense bed, there is virtually no dissolved oxygen in the water, and therefore it is uninhabitable to fish, plankton, and other crustaceans or other species. So your job is really about risk reduction, and we're never going to be able to prevent the introduction and spread of all invasive species, but we can definitely prevent some introductions and slow the spread of, of invasive species. Once invasive species, whether it's a plant or animal, becomes established in a waterway, we do have a number of management tools that we can use to help contain them, prevent their spread, and in some cases where we are able to detect them early enough, we might be able to eliminate or eradicate a certain population or infestation. We have physical controls. We can go underwater with scuba diving and, and manually remove individual plants. We can put mats down over those plants. Um, we can dredge. We are able to use a few chemicals for pesticides and herbicides to manage dense populations of aquatic plants or infestations of certain fish species. And then we have other controls um, we have biological controls. There's been a lot of research conducted on certain weevils and beetles that if bred and released can go out and cause enough damage to our target plant of concern that it can reduce the population um, and try and help limit its spread. These management techniques are very time consuming and they're very costly. So we'll talk about a bit more about the ecological impacts of invasive species and these are very challenging because some are clear to see and others are very difficult to measure. We do know that invasive species are the second leading cause for the loss of biodiversity worldwide and that's second only to habitat destruction or habitat loss. When invasive species come into some systems, they can cause something called ecosystem simplification, where a lot native species may be displaced. For example, in the photograph in the hand, you're seeing a native mussel that is um, being surrounded or colonized by the invasive zebra mussel. The zebra mussel is not eating the native mussel. It simply prefers to grow on hard substrate. And when it grows in dense um, patches on a native mussel, it can encrust it to the point where the native mussel is no longer able to open and feed. Um, so it will suffocate the mussel. Um, in the other photograph, we see a picture along the shore of Lake Champlain from a landlocked population of an introduced or invasive alewife species. And the alewife is very sensitive to temperature and oxygen changes in the water. And we experience some significant changes, particularly in the spring, we see die-offs. And sometimes these die-offs occur in such great um, densities that they wash up on the shore and are very foul smelling and can cause human health uh, impacts. Invasive species, when they're introduced, as we talked about earlier, can take advantage uh, because of their, um, they're new and they don't have parasites or predators. They're capable of um, it eating many, many different organisms early in their life stages if they are growing first um, or faster. And this can disrupt the food chain and cause um, the, this loss of uh, diversity either in the quantity or the number uh, of, um, sorry, the number or diversity of species. So in some cases we've seen invasive crustaceans like the spiny water flea or the fishhook water flea introductions to Lake Champlain. We've seen significant shifts in the phytoplankton community um, where certain species are almost non-existent because they're predated upon so heavily. Uh, early in the introduction and other uh, species may be affected because that would be their food source. So you can see cascading effects. Specifically about aquatic invasive species plant uh, impacts, uh, we see very dense beds of aquatic invasive plants 
This is uh, the invasive variable leaf milfoil. This is an infestation where it's basically a monostan. So in this section of a lake, there's no or very little plant diversity, no native plants present. Because the species can grow early in the season and can grow from the bottom of the lake to the top of the water column, it uses up a lot of uh, light and oxygen. So it doesn't allow for light penetration down for other plants to utilize. So this decreases the habitat complexity in some cases that can cause impacts um, associated with erosion or sediment stability, um, where you can then lead to increased sediment and nutrient loading. In some cases, the plants may accelerate the natural aging of the lake because there's such dense beds of aquatic plants um, causing impacts to the pH and temperature within a there are also costly impacts from invasive species. The zebra mussel, for example, can clog water intake pipes. Um, it can cut the feet of swimmer, cut the feet of swimmers or folks who recreate on beaches. They can encrust native mussels. They can encrust historic shipwrecks. Um, here you see a photograph on the top of that dense water chestnut population in the southern end of Lake Champlain, reducing water quality so there's no oxygen. Uh, there and that really leads to an environment where folks do not prefer to recreate. Um, and when we have those impacts to tourism, uh, that brings less money to our region. So that's a huge economic impact. We also have properties along lakes where there are dense populations of aquatic plants or invasive species infestations where their property value decreases. So we are most concerned in the Adirondack region with the recreational use of our waters and where there are dense beds of aquatic vegetation or invasive species growing. Um, we have issues with boat access, with swimming, with fishing, and therefore birding and hunting. And that has an economic impact to our region. The Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program conducted a study uh, a few years ago that evaluated the economic impacts of just eight of the known invasive species in the Adirondack Park. Uh, that includes four aquatic and four terrestrial species. And just from this study, there was an estimated annual loss of 48 to $53 million a year due to the impact of these eight species. Uh, there was also an evaluation of the property value loss due to the impacts of these species, which is somewhere between four and nine hundred million dollars. So our programs are all based on data collection and science, and we follow what the science tells us. We observe new infestations in the Adirondack Park as well as across you know, the northern North America, where we see infestations popping up right next to boat launches or at the boat launch itself, indicating that boats and trailers and other recreational equipment are a vector for introduction and spread. And oftentimes this introduction and spread is unintentional. Boaters and anglers simply do not intend to transport the early life stages of zebra mussels, eggs or pathogens that they can't see with the naked eye, and in some cases plants that become impinged between their boat and their trailer. They do not intend to move these things across the landscape and introduce them into their favorite lake where they like to recreate. So our job is really to talk to the anglers and the boaters who are visiting these lakes and remind them of the risk of spread and introduction and inform them that there are very simple measures they can take with cleaning and draining and drying their boats and equipment. Nobody needs to be able to identify invasive species. All you need to know is you don't move it. It doesn't matter if it's native, non-native, invasive. We do not want to move it from one body of water to another. There has been some research conducted on the efficacy of boat launch stewardship and the ability of stewards to remove plants in particular from uh, boats and recreational equipment in the trailers 
And just by visually inspecting and removing what you can see, you are 88% effective at preventing the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive plants. However, when it comes to the early life stages of some species, um, the resting eggs, the, that, that first instar stage of life, um, or pathogens that we can't see with the naked eye that might be in water, um, in the bilge, or in a live well, or in the motor, it is really necessary to ensure that the boats are drained. So they're cleaned off, you can feel the hull to see if you can feel for any bumps or early life growth of zebra mussels on the hull of a vessel. And then if we find any water or any um, organisms within a boat compartment or on recreational equipment, we will use high pressure water on the, ex on the outside or exterior of the boat and we'll use a high uh, high temperature, so hot water, 140 degrees for the external uh, side of the boat and the internal compartments we use 120 degrees Fahrenheit to flush out and to kill any of those organisms that we cannot see with the naked eye. And that is 91% effective at preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species. That's really great news. That means that w the tools that we have on hand and what we can use is effective at reducing uh, the introduction. The Adirondack Park in the blue and all the arrows coming to it um, is showing you that between 2015 and 2018, the Adirondack Watershed Institute Steward Program collected data on the last body of water visited that vessels were coming from before they entered an Adirondack Lake. And they found that the top six lakes that vessels were coming from were water bodies that have a significant number of known non-native invasive species. The Hudson River, Saratoga Lake downstate in New York, the Atlantic Ocean, the St. Lawrence River, Lake Ontario, part of the Great Lakes, and the Mohawk River. So this is a variation of a spider map that shows that all these pressures of the visitors coming overland in a very short period of time are very likely to be bringing unwanted aquatic hitchhikers unbeknownst to them and reminding them of cleaning and draining and drying is really important. Everyone who's ever been involved in invasive species management will at some point in their careers see this diagram. Uh, this is to show the relationship between the time of introduction of a new invasive species, uh, the, the amount of space or acres that it inhabits over time, and the increase in control cost uh, relative to the time. So early on, if we're able to intersect an invasive species, either preventing it from being introduced or finding it early, then it's very likely that we can get in with some simple tools and not a lot of money or time and remove it and be successful. But oftentimes the public and, and others who are not out there actively looking for invasives don't notice new invasives until it's very far along in the invasion curve. And this is why volunteers and early detection and monitoring programs are so critical. And the Boat Launch Steward Program serves as a key part of that early detection and rapid response function, because if you uh, encounter an invasive species uh, that looks strange or just an organism that you think looks strange or not from here or something you don't uh, recognize and report that to your supervisor, we're able to get in there and have an early warning that there may be a source of an invasive species for a certain lake that needs some further investigation. And early detection and rapid response is really critical. So if we can find one strand of purple loosestrife or a few clumps of Eurasian water milfoil uh, in a lake, then we might be able to get in and manage it. But if we sit back and wait until it's really noticed by, by folks who aren't looking for it, we will have a very large infestation that is unlikely to be managed successfully. So prevention, early detection, and rapid response are keys to success control. The state of New York 
is very advanced in invasive species management. They have divided the state into eight partnerships for regional invasive species management. So each prism has a coordinator that is in touch with the local lake and watershed organizations and other uh, water quality related groups who are all coordinated and organized in an effective manner at volunteer monitoring and early detection, prevention programs, management programs, and sharing research. The program that you're a part of is the most advanced in the state of New York. It is funded by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation through the Environmental Protection Fund. The Adirondack Watershed Institute has a $9 million grant over five years to deploy boat launch stewards and decontamination stations across the landscape to effectively intercept and reduce the spread of invasive species. There are many, many lakes in the Adirondack parks that are not invaded or infested with any invasive species. So it, we have a, a, a lot to protect in the Adirondack park um, and it's park wide in scope, which is really exciting. And in 2019, Adirondack Watershed Institute at Paul Smith College had 72 boat launches covered with stewards, or covered by stewards, and 27 decontamination stations operable. They also were able to coordinate with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program and the state and others to bring a boat inspection station to the Adirondack Welcome Center. And when we think about that vector of roads and, and how important the roadways are in terms of bringing overland transport of recreational boats and trailers uh, into uninvaded water bodies. It's wonderful to have uh, this welcome center inspection station so folks can have their boat inspected and decontaminated before they even get into the heart of the Adirondacks. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation was proactive in establishing rules and regulations on their boat launches that they own and operate. In 2014, they passed a transport regulation prohibiting launching and retrieval of boats with visible plants or animals. And they also required that uh, watercraft and bilge, uh, live wells, any other compartment was drained prior to launching and when retrieved. This really helped start prevent um, additional spread of invasive species in the state. And it was followed just a few years later by a state regulation which applies to all boat launches in the state, uh, not just New York Department of Environmental Conservation launches. So this one went into effect in 2016. It's due to sunset in 2021, but it covers statewide prohibitions on launching in any public body of water without taking reasonable precautions. And those reasonable precautions are to remove plants and mud and animals before transporting the equipment, draining or eliminating water for any compartments and cleaning and drying. And in the places where decontamination stations exist, if it's a high risk vessel, they are to use those high pressure hot water capabilities to help reduce the spread of invasive species. So in conclusion, invasive species do have quite a tremendous environmental and economic impact to the Adirondack Park and the Northeast region. Human activities are largely responsible for the introduction and spread, although they are mostly unintentional. So prevention and early response are critical and your job as a boat launch steward being the boots on the ground and doing that prevention and education work are very helpful in preventing introductions and become huge multi-year, multi, you know, in some cases, millions of dollar management programs. Um, volunteer efforts are very important in establishing routine monitoring of lakes and, and rivers in our region. And although the, the visitors and the users of these lakes are the larger the reason why invasive species are introduced, they are also going to be the solution. So they're going to help us to employ um, best management practices like clean, drain, and dry to help prevent the spread of 
we often say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think one steward is worth so, so much on these boat launches to help share this message that we love our lakes, we care about our lakes and our water quality and imparting that message and responsibility on the users of these waters. So really reinforcing that clean, drain and dry message is very important. And I'd like to close out by letting you know I care so much about water. Um, I have been dedicated to working on water quality with the Lake Champlain Basin Program for the last 17 years. And I'm doing it for myself, I'm doing it for my parents, I'm doing it for my children, and hopefully for their children. I am strongly connected to recreating on the water, being in or under the water. Um, and I have two little munchkins who are quickly becoming uh, water lovers themselves. And I've um, connected here or linked a short video of our vacation time on Lake George that highlights why water is so important to me. Thank you.